Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're talking all about cerebral palsy, often abbreviated as CP. So as always, let's start off with our practice question. The nurse is supervising a graduate nurse caring for a child with cerebral palsy, which action by the graduate nurse requires intervention. The graduate nurse A initiates gentle range of motion exercises, B lowers the bed to its lowest position, C wheels the client to the playroom via a wheelchair, or D feeds the client with the head of the bed elevated at 30 degrees. Okay, let's start off with the big picture here because CP, cerebral palsy, it's not just like one single easy disease. It's more of an umbrella term for a group of permanent disorders that affect movement, posture, and muscle tone. The key word here is permanent because CP results from non-progressive brain damage that occurs before, during, or shortly after birth, so right around the birth time. Now, non-progressive is key here because the brain injury itself, it does not get worse over time, but the effects can change as the child grows and develops. So this all starts with some sort of damage to the motor control centers of a developing brain. Remember, this is all right around the time of birth. So most often this is like the motor cortex, the basal ganglia, or the cerebellum. These are the brain's kind of traffic control towers, so to speak, for movement. And when they're injured, signals between the brain and the muscles can kind of get, you know, scrambled, delayed, or misdirected, okay? Those traffic control towers are not functioning at full speed. The muscles are still capable of contracting and therefore moving our limbs, but the brain's ability to coordinate is impaired. So as I said, this damage happens around about birth. Prenatally, this could be because of a maternal infection. Think rubella or toxoplasmosis. Maybe there's an intrauterine stroke, hypoxic injury. It could even be a genetic syndrome. Now, perinatal, think, you know, during the birth process, it could maybe be birth asphyxia, a complication during delivery, maybe some sort of trauma. And then after birth, postnatal causes, it could be severe jaundice leading to kernicterus. Remember, when that bilirubin gets lodged in the brain, it can damage those motor control centers. Maybe the baby gets meningitis or there's a TBI. So regardless of when or how, we have some sort of damage to a motor control center in the brain. So how does this actually show up in the body? There are going to be motor impairments, difficulty with fine motor skills, trouble walking, abnormal reflexes, or poor posture. There will be problems with muscle tone, and this can go one of two ways. We can be too stiff, which is called hypertonic, or too floppy, hypotonic. It can also be a mix of those two muscle tone problems, and it can change over time. It's important to note that the motor dysfunction extends to our oral muscles. So think trouble swallowing, chewing. Speech is often very challenging due to that poor coordination of the mouth and the tongue muscles. Overall speech, chewing, swallowing. There are lots of big risks with feeding and aspiration in kiddos who have cerebral palsy. They also don't have great head and neck control paired with that impaired swallowing coordination. You know what I'm getting at here. This is a huge aspiration risk. So very important to elevate the head of their bed. We want it at at least 45 degrees during feeding. So gravity's on our side and we keep that airway as open as possible. Now, last thing to know, in addition to the muscle tone, the motor impairments, the oral motor dysfunction, there can be some associated conditions such as seizures, vision or hearing problems, and some kids can have learning disabilities. I do think it's really important to note not all kiddos with CP will have cognitive impairment. It is totally going to depend on exactly where and how severe that brain injury was. But the big picture takeaway thinking for the NCLEX and your nursing exams 
is that cerebral palsy is an umbrella term where we have brain injury in those motor areas. So it's going to lead to motor control problems, muscle tone abnormalities, and that's going to cause mobility challenges. So a lot of our care is about safety, positioning. We have high aspiration risk. That is going to be huge to our nursing care. So I have been lucky to take care of many kiddos with cerebral palsy. Unfortunately, they are at higher risk for respiratory illnesses going along with that aspiration risk. So not uncommon to see them admitted into either the floor or the PICU if they have some sort of illness. They do need a little bit more support during those times of illness. So thinking back to which story I wanted to pull out today, it was actually a, a teenager with a spastic cerebral palsy. And they were admitted during, it was, you know, flu RSV season. I'm pretty sure they were positive for flu A. It had turned into a, a good, you know, bronchiolitis situation. And they were having trouble clearing their secretions. And mom was worried about aspirating. She said he had been coughing more during his meals. He seemed more tired than normal. And I do just want to pause here and say, when a mom, especially of a kiddo with a chronic condition, tells you that something is off, even if it's just they're tired after eating. That doesn't necessarily sound like the end of the world. You need to take that seriously. That mom knows her kid unlike anything else. The smallest change is something she will pick up on. I don't know this kiddo, so I'm not going to pick up on that. Just because I'm the nurse does not mean I know better. So that mom is your number one ally. Make her your best friend. She is really the person who's going to make you be able to care for this child the best. So she's telling me that something is off. I completely believe her. The SLP, speech language pathologist, was consulted to come in and do a swallow study. So what that looks like is they give little bites of different levels of food and kind of see the swallowing muscles they're using and evaluating for aspiration risk. And this kiddo had a known aspiration risk, so it was not surprising that the speech language pathologist did think he was likely aspirating and that that could be tied into some of the respiratory illness. He was also positive for flu, so there was, there was a lot going on. He definitely needed some support. So starting off with the feeding interventions, the SLP recommended a modified diet, and at least while we were clearing up this respiratory infection, that we were going to make sure we were elevating that head of the bed at least up to 45 degrees and doing more small, frequent meals. So lots of interventions that we have to talk about because there is quite a bit going on. But first and foremost, while the SLP was in the room, we talked about airway safety during feeding. Positioning, we wanted them up at least 45 degrees to keep that airway higher than the esophagus and reduce the chance of aspirating. The SLP actually modified their diet a little bit, made sure we were doing really small bites, slow pacing, watching for that complete swallow before the next bite. So he already was working with speech therapy and he was going to continue working with speech therapy, probably having some different modifications. They can modify texture, thickened liquids. They're a little easier to control, things like that. It's also important to work with a dietitian. They are likely going to recommend making sure we get really good nutrient-dense foods. Because it's a lot of work to coordinate all that swallowing, children with CP will often get very tired during meals, but they have high caloric needs. They're still growing like any other kiddo. So really making sure we pack those nutrients in that can be eaten in smaller amounts is going to be important. Now, moving on from the feeding, some other interventions I want you to be thinking about for cerebral palsy. This client had a lot of mobility issues and muscle contractures from the spastic nature of their cerebral palsy. So they were very hypertonic. Their tone was very high, and that had caused some of their muscles to almost get stuck in certain positions. That's what we call a contracture. For them, it was mostly in their hands. We worked with PT and OT on some braces to help with that. 
gentle range of motion very important. And this child was also on oral diazepam. That is going to help with some of loosening up and is common in a spastic type cerebral palsy. This client did not have a baclofen pump, but I do just want to mention that I've seen that a lot in cerebral palsy. Baclofen is a muscle relaxer and that can really help with the tight contractures and hypertonicity. So you will sometimes see a baclofen pump used in CP. Another thing that this particular client did not struggle with that I still just want to put on your radar is, remember I said seizures can be quite common in cerebral palsy. So if they are struggling with seizures, you will likely have some sort of anti-epileptic medication. This client did not struggle with that. The, the contractures and the hypertonicity were much harder for them. So all of that said, there's, you know, lots of long-term things we've talked about. The other things I want to put on your radar intervention-wise when we have some sort of acute respiratory illness like this in CP is we need to help them clear their secretions and move that junk out of their lungs. With all the different, you know, hypertonicity, the spasticity, they don't have the ability to control those secretions quite as well. So we do things like chest physiotherapy, where we try to break up all of that mucus, really good suctioning. And for this client, we did some nebulizers with 3% hypertonic saline to help pull out some of that junk and help suction it out to clear up those lungs. Now, if there had been a bacterial infection, we would have jumped right on it with an antibiotic. This was the flu, and we felt like aspiration was a component too, but with the flu, we did not worry about an antibiotic. We did give some Tylenol, acetaminophen, to help control fever and comfort, but it was really mostly about protecting that airway, lifting them up so we didn't have aspiration risks, helping clear those secretions, and keeping them comfortable so we could support them during that infection. So lots of interventions. Let's wrap it all up by looking back at these interventions in our practice question. We have a nurse supervising a graduate nurse who is caring for a child with cerebral palsy, which action by the graduate nurse requires intervention. Is it A, initiating gentle range of motion, B, lowering the bed to its lowest position, C, wheeling the client into that playroom with a wheelchair, or D, feeding them with the head of bed at 30 degrees. What do you think? Which one requires intervention? What is something you would not do? It is D, all right? We know with those motor difficulties, swallowing is quite hard, hard controlling those secretions, so we want them elevated up to a minimum of 45 degrees, not 30. 30 is too low, that would require intervention. All of our other choices though are great things to do for clients with CP. Range of motion exercises can really help with those contractures and even preventing contractures. Lowering the bed is necessary to prevent falls and transporting them to the playroom in a wheelchair, absolutely great. So key takeaway, I know this one was a lot. These complex chronic conditions are confusing. But with CP, I want you thinking, hey, this is an umbrella term for permanent disorders that affect movement. Okay, it's permanent, but it's non-progressive. I've got some sort of damage. It happened around the time of birth, and that damage involved the centers that control motor motion. So we're going to have trouble with motion. We're going to have trouble with our muscles being hyper or hypotonic, swallowing muscles, oral muscles. It's all about the motion, those movement areas. That's really the big takeaway with CP. If you think about that, all of the other interventions that we've talked so much about really start to make sense. Right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on demand video lectures, high yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com 
follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.